Welcome, David and Wendy. Okay, to Seven Terraces. This is uh, the shop in Seven Terraces. David, um, if uh, you all don't know him already, he is an expert on imperial Chinese textiles, and he just gave a talk uh, just now on the Emperor Qianlong's wardrobe, which I found very interesting because I looked at a lot of these outfits and I thought they were from the Peking Opera. <laughs> <laughs> And Wendy, Wendy is here um, as, well, is David's wife, and uh, she's a student of the Royal School of Needlework. So I'm going to quiz her on a fair bit of the embroideries that we have here in the in strict Chinese culture and heritage that I don't really know much about. I suppose I've brought these two pieces here. I, I'm, I'm adding layers to the rooms and the hotel every year, right? So this year, I've come across a lot of these curtains. I've just brought in these because they were just framed the last few days. So this is half of a pair of curtains, right? So there are two, two pairs of curtains here. And then upstairs I had a purple one. So these are very bright colours that I... Yeah. Number one, I don't think they were Chinese colours. I, I was just in the same here, we were looking and on the porcelain as well. It yeah. seems to be a very distinct, yeah. straight style. I, I think that the colours were there, like the straight Chinese um, porcelain. I saw quite a fair bit of you know, not huge amounts of it, but in the Jiaqing period, the early, the early part of the Low Qing, what yeah. do you call it? The High Qing and the Low Qing. Yeah. <laughs> because in the Kangxi and Qianlong period, you never saw colours, did you? Um, Qianlong liked vivid colours. His own personal tastes yeah. were very much of the, the bright, almost the, the, the gaudy tastes. Yeah. I show a picture where uh, there's a porcelain bowl, yeah. which looks like a piece of um, Clarus Cliff, the modern, yes, modern British, British Brit yeah, mm -hmm. uh, um, who had uh, become famous for uh, uh, sort of mm -hmm. uh, very garish colours. So I think he personally favoured them, but but um, I think the big the, the big change in colours uh, for mainland China came when Aniline dyes for textiles found their way into China. So 1880s, 1890s. And you see these artificial dyes mm -hmm. that are so much more um, vibrant and vivid, and, and they didn't uh, fade in any way near as quickly right. as the. So these are aniline dyes, obviously. Um, I think. I think. What? What? what where, when do you date this back to? That one's more difficult. I. I would think this is. Late nineteenth century. Mm. It's, it's a sort of period that you tend to gravitate to because there was so much production. Yes. Um, uh, unfortunately, the quality was tailing away, mm. but the production was rising because the demand was, was, was so high. But what what's, uh, certainly struck me while I'm here, even in the, in the iconography, there's a distinct style in yes. this part of the world. But you know that when you show that uh, outfit with the Phoenixes, yeah. it reminded me instantly of the phoenixes that is so prevalent in straight Chinese culture. Yeah. Come and have a look at here. Those green based yeah. ceramics are very, very much, that's why I feel that, you know, there's not that much of it in China, that this was chosen because yeah. of, possibly, I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's why it's such a fascinating subject. Yes. And these remind me a little bit more of the sort of cushions you'd find in the Forbidden City. Yeah. Oh, really? um, where you don't have the traditional long, uh, um, uh, long decorative silk uh, chair cover. Um, but these would form cushion backs and cushion seats. And, and, and they're sort of scalloped and shaped. And did you buy your best pieces outside of China? Yes. Or? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's not much left there, right? No, no, I think, I think a lot of those pieces probably um, were acquired quite easily from uh, for, for in the sort of 1911 to 1920s, 30s. So um, much poverty at the time, people were dislo being dislocated. Yeah. yeah. 
um, mm -hmm. they were acquiring pieces or they had them in the family or, or workshops were just shutting down. Mm -hmm. we, we bought um, a riding jacket which appeared to have never been delivered to the person that commissioned it. Do you ever wonder how come there's so much of this average quality imperial robes around? Well, I, I've got a theory. Now <laughs> <laughs> quiet. <laughs> It's like porcelain, you know, there's so much porcelain around. Yeah. I'm not sure about porcelain, but I do know with, um, so you're the emperor and you want a, a new robe. So the imperial workshops would, uh, would be requested to produce a robe for a particular occasion. Yeah. They would make at least three. It would be typical to make three identical robes. Because the emperor always had to have a choice of which robe he chose to wear. So once the Board of Rights signed off, this was perfect and, and presentable to you as the Emperor, you would look at the three robes and you'd select number two. Mm -hmm. In theory, numbers one and number three had to be destroyed because who was going to wear the Emperor's robe? Yes. Only the Emperor. <laughs> My theory is, you're right, there are too many uh, robes that one doesn't doubt the provenance, they, they were produced for the Emperor, mm -hmm. but they were probably never worn by I the see. Emperor. Rather than being destroyed, but said, there's 18 months work here. I can't destroy. Put it and, away. And the princes uh, or the duke's objects are different. Yes. Clearly different. Yeah. I mean, they would be made in, in, in the, certainly the princes they would be, and princesses, they would be coming from the same workshops. Mm -hmm. But obviously, the emperors and the empresses' robes took priority. Um, but the system wasn't quite the same way. Mm -hmm. You didn't have. You know, you'd have a robe, and as long as you approved of it. Mm. Um, but the other thing is, it may only have been worn once. Mm. No, so I was wondering if the ones that were rejected would they have gone to the dukes and the princes? No, <laughs> they would, would, would no. be the wrong colour. Yeah. They would be imperial yellow. I see. That's yeah. the point. The, the, the point was there was there was only the emperor, empress, or if a dowager empress, the highest two ranks of imperial consorts. That's it. Mm. Imperial yellow was exclusive to that group. So. Anyway, it looks fascinating talking to you, yeah. and I'm, I'm, please, please come back, you know. I would love to. Yeah. I have a, I have a interesting collection of, I only collect things of my heritage so that mm. it makes sense to me, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, it just doesn't mean anything well, to me. We understand as collectors, you have to have discipline, yes. otherwise you go everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> but even within the porcelain, China, the straight Chinese porcelain, I've decided to focus on only one shape. In the, in the reception. Yeah. Mm. So because there's so many different shapes you know, and vessels, so you go quite crazy yes. doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to be basically be very focused. But when I buy things from stock, it's mm. different things. You know, to, yeah. Yeah. But we did say when we started, we were only going to get squares and circles. Oh, right. But we have shoes, we have sleeve bands, <laughs> we have...